This afternoon, we're going to, if you look, you'll see, it's boots on the ground. And the three people who are up here are going, are people who have all dealt with these issues every day in various settings. So, uh, at my far left, it feels so cliche to say, but it's Father Michael Flager. I don't think he needs any introduction. <laughs> So, um, at the age of 31, Father Flager became the youngest full pastor um, in the diocese when he was appointed pastor of St. Sabina Church. And if you've never been to St. Sabina, and I don't care what your religion is, if you want a fully immersed cultural experience a sort of melting pot experience. You can be Catholic, you can be Baptist, uh, you can even be Buddhist. You can go to St. Sabina and feel at home. <laughs> so you should attend the service, visit, fellowship, um, you need me to. Um, since 1968, Father Flager has lived in ministry. Let's go on to the next person. I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> Father Flager. <laughs> Thank you, though. Oh, Go on the next one. Is also a woman who needs very little introduction. If you don't know her, you certainly should know her name, and that is Elizabeth Dozier. Elizabeth Dozier is the principal of Finger High School. In 2009, she was charged with transforming one of Chicago's most challenging schools. Under her leadership, the school has seen a 15%, 15% decrease in the dropout rate, a 75% decrease, 75% 75 de decrease in misconduct, a 38% increase in the percentage of freshmen on track to graduate on time, and double-digit increases in attendance, high school graduation, and college enrollment. Ms. Dozier is a nationally board certified teacher in mathematics and graduate of the New Leaders Principal Preparation Program. She holds a bachelor's degree in business and a master's degree in educational leadership. The uh, third uh, person on the panel is the Honorable Thomas Sumner. Uh, and Judge Sumner, who is recently retired, is the former president of the Cook County Bar Association for the 1984-1985 year. He was appointed to the bench as an associate judge in 1988 at the age of 35. Judge Sumner is a very young man. He and I share the same birthday, so I, I know he's young. Um, he was the youngest African-American ever to be appointed judge in Cook County. He retired in 2007 after serving nearly 20 years as a trial judge for the Circuit Court of Cook County. The last 12 of those years was in the criminal division, what we call 26 in California. During his judicial career, he was a faculty member of the Capital Cases Seminar Series Committee and a member of the Illinois Pattern Jury Instruction. He has also served as a volunteer instructor and judge for law school trial advocacy and moot court competitions at John Marshall, Loyola, and here, the University of Chicago Law Schools. Our fourth panelist who is supposed to be here is a young man named Marcus Redwood. Uh, Marcus could not be here today. I simply would like to say a few things about him that will help inform this conversation. Uh, Marcus Redwood is a very shy young man. I met him, I'm not sure, where's my historian, Michelle Geller? Okay. Uh, it, she says 17 years ago. Anyway, uh, he was 13 at the time. He also was a DCFS ward. He lived with a foster mother who, when I, when I went to interview her, it was my belief she was doing cranberry and vodka at about 10 o'clock in the morning. She also, she had Marcus and his younger brother. They were not allowed in the home without her. 
they were not allowed to have a key uh, to the home. They were living on 47th and Prairie. Uh, so he would leave school and sit out on the stoop uh, until she came home and let them in. And he, as a 13-year-old, was involved in a gang. He uh, was arrested and charged with murder for a shooting. There were five kids arrested and charged. He was bringing up the rear uh, as they shot, as someone else shot. He was part of a group of five. He too, similarly to Xavier, had had juvenile interventions before. Again, he was 13. He was transferred to adult court and was tried as an adult. Um, during that time, we filed a motion to suppress his uh, statements. He gave, in those days, a court-reported statement at the police station. It took us, and he grew up basically in the detention center. By the time we got ready for trial, he probably was in the detention center for about three years. Um, we did a motion to suppress his statements, both based on the fact that he had not graduated eighth grade, um, that he was 13 years old at the time. He was unaccompanied by any adult. And also, um, one of the primary reasons that the statement was suppressed is that they always ask, how did the police treat you? Have you eaten? Are you OK? And when asked, did, how did the police treat you, Marcus said, fine, except for the time you hit me in my head. Um, the statement was suppressed. Uh, and he was released. He was released from the county jail at approximately 10 o'clock at night. And I'm not blaming any particular institution, but when he was released from the county jail, he had never been on the west side of the city. It was 10 o'clock at night. His DCFS worker said, it's too late. Um, he had, what, maybe $2 and a bus card or whatever. Anyway, the statute of limitations has run. So Michelle Geller and I went and kidnapped the DCFS ward. Um, and took him, pardon me, from Popeyes. We told him we'd meet him at Popeyes in 26th in California. By this time, it is 11 o'clock at night. We kidnap him and we take him to a place called Merrillville. And they said, you cannot bring him inside. Drop him off in the parking lot because otherwise we'd be guilty of being in receipt of a kidnap. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so call us when you get in the parking lot, and then we'll go out there and go, oops, we found a homeless minor. Um, and that's exactly what we did. Marcus has, so he was raised basically in the detention center and in Merrillville. He has not had, and I think he speaks more for most of our kids who get out, he has had some additional run-ins with the law. I have continued to represent him over time. What he's been arrested for since he got out, he did uh, go to school, he did get his high school diploma, he got arrested for selling $10 worth of you know, marijuana on 63rd and Cottage Grove. Uh, so he now has an adult felony conviction. Uh, he had agreed to come and speak to us today. We have maintained contact, as Michelle said, over the past 17 years. He called yesterday. He said, I have an opportunity. He works whenever he can. He uh, is now doing day labor. He called and says, I have to go to work today. And we said, you certainly do. But his spirit is here with us. And again, uh, I think another child saved uh, that needed saving, and now a young adult that needs help. So with that said, boots on the ground. Father Flager, you've been at this, and you've seen it in all kinds of ways, not just in your own parish, but also in your own home. Um, share with us what we need to be doing better. What aren't we doing? Um, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the uh, invitation to be here today. Let me talk from two levels. First of all, as, um, from a faith person, I think that the faith communities have abandoned their purpose. And I think the churches have abandoned the community. 
And I don't look for government to change things, but I look for faith communities that say they have the power of God to make the change and be the agents of change. I think we in our faith communities have to see not just members in congregation, but I have to think we have to begin seeing the whole community as our members. And I think we ought to be able to see ourselves as training up leaders who impact the community and not just live in the community or drive to the community. So I think that's our first part. And I think we also then have to train up leaders who are going to be lobbyists um, for the issues we see, and particularly with the issues today of violence. Um, Dr. King told us it was not just picking up the man on the side of Jericho's role, but changing the kind of society that placed them there. And I think that has to be what our prophetic voice has to be about, is being the lobbyist of a society that is placing people on the side of Jericho's road every day, and now it's become norm. Um, I think we have to fight for those systematic changes, systemic changes that have to, have to, have to be, be changed in this society, like education. Um, the education system is still unjust and unequal. Um, when we live in a society, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, where today, your education still depends primarily on your zip code and your race. That's not acceptable. And we have to fight that. I don't care if it's public school, charter school, home school, private school. It's got to be a good school. And it's got to be good education because education brings people options. I get angry and I get incensed when I run into a 19, 20, and 21 year old who cannot read or write but went through a school system. That is unacceptable. We have to fight to change and call this the scam that what education is in our society today. We have to deal with the unemployment issue. And when I hear that the America's unemployment has dropped to 6.2 percent, I'm convinced then that obviously Englewood, Longdale, Auburn, Gresham, Rosen, they were not part of America. Because in my community, the unemployment is 24 to 32 percent. So if you say it's 6 percent in America, well, it's not in America. It's 6 percent in some parts of America, but not in America. So we have to deal with unemployment. You can't keep telling people uh, that things are getting better when in the whole trickle down of Reagan and unfortunately the rising tide of Barack Obama, neither of them work. You have to target areas where there's unemployment and even the playing field across the society. We have to deal with the unemployment issue. We have to deal with the issue of poverty. We have to enable people to be able to rise up and live in and take care of themselves and, and be responsible for themselves. Dr. King told us there's something wrong with the nation that creates beggars. We're still creating beggars. There's something wrong with the society where we have so many of our young people that are living from couch to couch or abandoned building to abandoned building and have no stable place to call their own and not have a job to be able to rise above your conditions. So we have to fight the issue of poverty. We have to deal with the entertainment world that glorifies violence and that de and de denigrates women on a consistent basis where the B word becomes the norm of how we talk to one another. We have to face that and fight that. And yes, it, it's the chief keeps down here, but the reality is Chief Keith is being pimped. And he's being pimped by Interscope and Universal and Sony that are coming in and saying, we'll drop a million dollars and take a Chief Keith and put him up in Northbrook in a white gated community to talk about what's going on in Englewood. Well, first of all, you're a punk if you're talking about something, but you won't live there. But secondly, we gotta go after these real pimps that are creating this damage, like punches piled, wash their hands and say they have no responsibility. And the reality is Interscope and Sony and Universal and the rest of these entities create this stuff and they say, well, that's what they tell Tony Schofield, GCI, a member of my church who I love dearly, but they tell them, you spin these records. But the reality is they say, well, that's what people want to listen to. No, that's the appetite you develop. And if you develop that appetite, you now have a responsibility for changing that appetite and giving real food so people can understand what Tupac started out to be, what Common and what Lupe and Chance are about today. We have to change that appetite. We have to deal with mass incarceration and not only deal with locking all of our young people up, which has become the norm, so we can make money off them, the gun industry that invests in, 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 in prisons, so they can send guns out in the community and then make money off of people in prisons. And then when people come out, they have a lifelong sentence because nobody wants to hire them because you've been to jail. When in fact, the person that's saying no to them should have gone to jail but didn't get caught. But the reality is we have to enter with mass incarceration in our communities. We have to deal with parents and not just demonizing them, help them, care about them. 
DCFS, as I heard a long time ago, is not about taking care of kids and raising kids. DCFS real primary responsibility should be changing and helping the family so nobody has to go to a foster home. The best place a child can be is in a home. We just got to make the homes healthy. So we've got to create that, that parenting and we've got to empower communities. We've got our communities understand that nobody should care about your neighborhood more than you. And we cannot be prisoners or we cannot be asleep in our community. We have to take care of our community and make it the places we want to raise our children and our children can be safe. Two, two last quick things, I'll stop. Guns. When the hell are we going to get courage to deal with the NRA? I am so tired that the NRA has bought up and, and collectively decided in our minds that we need guns to be safe, that guns are what keeps you safe. Not a statistic in hell justifies that, but they keep saying that and we believe it. And so everybody thinks they got to have a gun. And, you know, I understand the, sec the, the, the Supreme Court interpreted the Second Amendment. I get that. First of all, let me say to you now, in case you know, the British are not coming back. <laughs> we do not have to worry about the British coming back. But secondly, We've got to understand that guns cannot become the primary of way we handle every bit of disagreement in our community. In the workplace, on the street, this cannot become the mentality that guns are how we live life. We've got to, we've got to regulate, we've got to make people responsible. Uh, I could go in there for an hour, but I won't. But last thing let me say is this, and this is what's most importantly to me. For the last number of years, my primary ministry has been on the street because I think the young brothers on the street, which we have demonized, which we've picked at the throwaways to tell them they're no good, they're useless, they're a burden to society. And so we've made them our enemy because somehow if we get rid of them, everything's going to be fine. No. We've got to start loving our young brothers and sisters on the street, respecting them, giving them opportunities, holding them accountable, yes, but giving them options. 95% of the brothers on the street that we deal with want options, that's all. Give me a job, give me an education, give me a possibility for my dreams and my purpose. 5% are crazy, they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do and they should be locked up. But hell, 5% of, more than 5% of ministers are crazy and I know more than 5% of the University of Chicago Law School is crazy. So, so 5% of every grouping is nuts. In fact, they're beating most of us. But 95% say just give me a chance. We reached out for the last two years we used basketball as a hook. We went to the four gangs in our neighborhood and said, let's bring you together to play basketball. Everybody said no. All the churches wouldn't join with us. The city wouldn't join with us. The police department would join us. The only person that connected and said he helped me out was Louis Farrakhan. He prevented guys to come in and be the security for the door. I mended inside. We came together and brought four gangs to play ball against each other. Everybody said it would be a bloodbath. We had 2,000 people in our gym, about eight gangs represented, and not a single problem ever happened in that gym, not a single incident happened in that gym. And we went from there to developing, hold up, I, I'm out of time. I, I went from there to developing what we call a peace tournament. And so for the last two years, we take guys from the street, the 60,000 that Chicago says are either dropped out, pushed out, or kicked out of our schools that are roaming the streets every day, and then we bring them into the tournament. Now we have 80 guys on, the, on Monday nights and the four, uh, ten, eight teams with uh, 10 on a team. And there's no longer a gang team. Now it's a draft. So on any given team, you have five or six gangs represented and now they're teammates. So they built relationships with each other where we used to have to pick them up with buses. Now they come on their own because everybody understands Sabina is our gang and nothing happens here. And the guys are, 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 the Nation of Islam, four guys are at the door, our men take care of the inside, not a single incident, and that became the hook to say, we want to help you reach your dream. So we put 160 of them through GED, 130 of them into jobs, and, and now last summer we hired 1,100 people for the summer. We're doing the same thing this summer. We found out that what, 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 we, what the young people want is saying, tell me you respect me, that you love me, that you really care about me that you're here to tell me that you want to help me succeed and not just doing it out of some obligation or some grant that you got, but that you're doing it because you love us. And when we do that, and thank God we've had outside people like Joe Kim Noah and Isaiah Thomas and Taz Gibson and Derek Rose, who have been very instrumental. Brandon Marshall's reached out. He wants to help out to meet with these guys because when the guy, these kind of guys come down to our gym and sit with the guys and they say, what do you want us to do? You know what the young person says to him? You already did it. You showed up. 
Young people want to know we love them and we care about them and we don't want to just lock them up and demonize them as the problems of our society. As I tell the young brothers, now stop with this one, I tell the young brothers, they were fighting over one of these blocks and shooting over one of these blocks, I realized that our first gang, we had somebody playing against a guy on another team who had shot him six months ago. And yet not a single incident happened and once when he fell during the game, the guy picked him up and helped him get back to his feet. But we realized though, when these guys were talking about this marsh field, that was their turf, the kill war turf, where they're gonna, that's their own. And I went over one day and I got four of them in a car. And I said, so you're fighting over this? And he said, yep. And I said, okay. I said, come on, get in the car. And we drove down the block. I said, tell me what you see on the block. And every five feet when we stopped, tell me what you see. Oh, abandoned building, empty lot, uh, garbage. I said, okay, and you're fighting over this. This is what you're fighting. This is what you're killing for. Yeah. We drove downtown. I pulled in front of City Hall and I got him out. Parked there, told the cop, leave me alone for five minutes. These guys are really dangerous. <laughs> we got out and I said, see this building here? This is City Hall. She had been across the street. That's the state of Illinois, baby. They bring money into the state and they give it to people here and they decide how it's spent in the city. Is this what you want to run? This is what you want because nobody's trying to take over Marshfield. But this is what you want to take over. This is what you want to run. Because here you can make a decision, not just for Marshfield, but for all of Auburn, Gresham, and Englewood. We've got to shift where our fights are and pick our fights well. Got back in the car that was quiet all the way home until we got back to Marshfield and getting out of the car. And one of the brothers looked at me, he said, Father Mike, I appreciate that. And he said, I get it, I get it. He said, but you know what? This shit here, this is all I got. And it really was a click of reality to me. As long as all we give our children is bad education, no jobs, no options, and no opportunities, how dare we say stop the violence? We got to stop the violence up here. They'll stop it down there. Thank you, Father Flager. Um, I'm so glad I was worried you were going to be shy. Um, <laughs> so. Principal Dozier, uh, I know lots of teachers and ex-teachers and retired teachers, and sometimes what I hear is, you just don't understand what it's like in them hallways. They're crazy. They're, you know, I've heard, had teachers say to me, you can tell by second grade who's going to the penitentiary. Um, uh, you know. Uh, they're ADHD, it's the parents' fault, you, see, you know, the mamas come up to school acting crazy, the daddies come up to school acting crazy. Um, you look like a nice, well-educated, you know, young woman. Um, why did you decide to go to Finger, uh, and how did you do what I told these people you did? How did you turn Finger around? So good afternoon. Um, so for me, I always find it interesting when people ask me the question about how did you wind up at Finger, because I think, why not Finger? When you think about um, schools and kids and communities that need additional support, that um, have all the hope and promise within them already, it's just a matter of getting a good team of support systems and stuff there. So I actually came there by way of business. My undergraduate degree is in business and was eternally, eternally bored with that. Um, and so went into education, which there is never a dull moment for any of you who work in uh, schools or work with children, there's never a dull moment. Um, but I think the, the most important thing in terms of what we did to really help shape our school was to essentially liberate the children's minds. And so I think there's a notion out there that we give kids something, but I feel like they have all the promise and possibility already within them. It's just a matter of them having a space, a safe space, that meets their needs, that provides them with what they need to actualize their own dreams and potential. So for us, what that looked like is we had a $1.6 million grant uh, from the federal government for four years. And so we were able to really address the needs in which the stu children came into the building with. So we, have, we had and have things built in the course of our school day like anger management, grief counseling, 
trauma therapy, mm -hmm. things that people don't think of when you think of a school, but this is what our children need. Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting that when we talk about you know, our, our own troops that go off to war and come back and we have psychological services for them and all these services and things built into place, but then you look at parts of our city or parts of our country when there are literal war zones happening right here, 30 minutes not even from us, and there aren't services for for children, for those who are seriously affected by this. And so we built things like that in the course of the school day. We developed things like reading programs. Students might say, people say they act out. Has anyone checked if the child can read? Mm -hmm. You try sitting somewhere for eight hours in, in, in a classroom and they're speaking Mandarin and reading Mandarin and you can't read it, well you might act out too. That's no different from our children who sit in, in classrooms and they can't read. And so we built in reading programs, literally teaching kids how to read. Um, on any given year, 40%, I want everybody to really hear this, because 40% of the students that come into my building or more come in and they cannot read. They are reading literally four and five grade levels behind. And we have some students that walk through our doors that are functionally illiterate. Mm. Sight words, uh, the, than, that they cannot read. And so really, again, giving them educationally, but also the social emotional supports that they need. Also restorative justice. That's a huge foundational aspect of our school. Oftentimes you see in schools um, just incessant suspension, incessant expulsion. There aren't really support systems built into place to give the students the tools in which to discuss. And so that restorative justice model has not only been implemented in the building, but it's carried out throughout the community. I can think of um, my first year there, I remember we had this parent that came in and she was pretty angry about something that happened in the community and she came in and it was my first year there and you know we're going to turn the school around and we're all excited and the parent comes in and she literally comes in to go to the lunchroom to fight another student. And so obviously, you know, we had to intervene and stop that. You can't go and fight another student in the cafeteria. That's not going to work. Um, but you fast forward two years later, two and a half years later, that same parent who had another child at my school came in and said, you know what, Ms. Dozier, we really need a peace circle. I need to talk, we need to get this parent, this parent, and our kids together and figure this out. And so when people talk about, you know, well, we don't want to invest in schools or invest in restorative justice or invest in these different things, they say, well, because only the, this little amount of kids here, so this is not really going to matter. We forget sometimes the ripple effect of what happens in our schools and how that actually infiltrates out into the community. I think that parent is a beautiful example of it. But I think ultimately what it will take is not just grants and these types of things, but it's really thinking about how do we restructure, how do we, how do we support and cultivate communities and with economic development, with opportunities. Oftentimes people will say, well, you know, the young people don't want to work or people don't want to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. But it's not true. Right. We had a job fair at our school. After school, you don't have to come, it's after school. We had over 300 young people lined up at 4 o'clock the other day. I think it was on Tuesday we had our job fair. Lined up for summer opportunities. So people, young people do want to be engaged. And so I think it's incumbent upon the school and the larger institutions within our city to really figure out how to do that. You said something um, that just broke my heart. You said you have instituted reading programs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be funny here. You said, and you are teaching children how to read. Yes. Finger is a high school. That's correct. Mm -hmm. How do you, what, what did we do that you would have to teach a freshman in high school how to read? If they made it to their freshman year, I'm assuming they went from kindergarten, maybe not, but first grade through eighth. What lessons did they learn in elementary school that you've got to teach them how to read now? And this is the stuff that really gets me upset because it is absolutely ridiculous to think we are in the United States of America and we have children walking in the doors of ninth grade that cannot read. Right. I had a, a friend of mine. It's ridiculous. I had a, a friend of mine who uh, was in the United States for a while, is now living back in Moscow, but is a, is a citizen, uh, uh, she's a Russian citizen, and she came, we are actually walking around this campus uh, a couple years ago, and we were talking about some of the issues that we, we face here at, at my particular school, and she couldn't believe it. She said to me, 
not in the United States of America, Liz. You've got to be exaggerating. That can't be happening. She literally could not believe that this was happening within our country, but it does. It's, it's, the, it's the, the pass along. We'll keep it quiet. We don't want to deal with Johnny. We're gonna, I don't want him in my classroom next year, so let me just kind of pass him out, move him out, and then he graduates, and then Johnny winds up in a high school. And unfortunately, and this is a sad part about it, this is not just, this is not just segregated to one school. Mm -hmm. This is happening in schools across the city of Chicago. Right. It's happening across the, across the United States of America, and people don't talk about it. They just pass him right along again in, the, in high school. And so what we did with our grant money was to really develop reading programs, small classes, literally teaching kids who are in, in coming into our school how to read. And unfortunately, that grant is gone. And so we had to make, you know, we had to make some really tough budget to see decisions. We had to increase class sizes this year so we could kind of squeeze out to get another teacher to be able to provide these services for the kids. But it's, it's absolutely, it's almost unfathomable when you think about it, that students would walk out of eighth grade and literally not be able to read or right in the United States of America. Um, Judge uh, Sumner, you know, we've talked a lot today about justice, and I want you to help us, and I'll start the discussion, um, because we are about to talk about all of this, I think, is sensitive and painful, but uh, before we leave today, we also need to sort of get to what I think is part of heart of the matter. And um, having done 12 years at 26 in California, you are certainly aware of the phrase that um, some people talk about justice, and then some of us talk about just us. And when we say just us, we are talking about people of color, African Americans and Latinos. And again, my, when I first started taking students to juvenile court, um, and because I believe they should watch and see what the system was about, and one of my students said to me, where do the white kids go to court? <laughs> Um, and I had to break it to them, they don't. Um, <laughs> you know, and we were talking about it this morning, and again, it seems to some of us that white children commit pranks, brown and black children commit crimes, um, and what is, what's, what's, what's that about? What's it about? What's that about? <laughs> Uh, well, I, just, just so everybody will know, I, uh, Hersella told me that uh, what she wanted me to address was the question of whether or not there was, I think you said implicit bias, bias in the uh, criminal justice system. And so uh, the simple answer to that question is yes. Um, in fact, I could stop there and we can have a discussion about it. I mean, the simple answer is yes. Um, but let's put it in context so we know what we're talking about. Um, implicit bias. What did you mean by that when you, when you uh, said Brought this would be the topic? Okay, well, here's the thing. Lately, there have been studies done. Some of you are familiar with the Harvard uh, test. Uh, and it is spreading, it, it's being used both in industry but also in, in judicial and other settings. And if you haven't taken the test, it's a test that you yourself can take online. But the results of the test show over time and fairly clearly that when both with African Americans or with anyone who takes the test, and it's a word association and you have to push positive or negative, uh, so there's a word and then there's a flash, I mean a millisecond flash of a face, and that face is either black or white. And over time and consistently, Good attributes are associated with the face of white people. Bad attributes are associated with the faces of people of color uh, and black people. And it, it has become known as, even for people who do not believe themselves to be, oh, I don't know, Donald Sterling, um, <laughs> there is still some bias, some predisposition, some inclination, a preference for white. 
and that that preference for white is working its way out. There's a judge uh, out of Iowa, a federal judge, that is doing a lot of this work now. And he is working with jurors to get them to understand that both, the, and that it cuts both ways. They've done studies, uh, they've expanded these studies, so that they show a room full of people an event. And they show them a young man with an object in his hand. People are three times more likely to believe that the young black man has a gun in his hand and is armed, even when he is not. And, and equally, they are less likely to see the gun in the white young man's hands. That's troubling. That is implicit bias in a nutshell. It's not the overt racism that we may see people most people don't call us names anymore, but there is still this sort of feeling that somehow we are not yet all equal and that justice at 26th Street is not blind. It ain't colorblind, it ain't blind. It's looking and making a judgment that may or may not depend on facts. And so, again, so the answer is, is there implicit bias? in the criminal justice system, and the answer is, is yes. There are, there are studies, and you alluded to one, but there are plenty of studies that indicate that racism is alive and well in the United States, and that we would be um, naive to believe that it's not a part of the criminal justice system, because the criminal justice system is a part of the United States. Um, the question is, uh, I, my question in my mind, first of all, is where does this start and how far does it go? Um, and I say that the criminal justice system, if you look at it uh, in its entirety, it's not just the judges. The judges play a small role, I believe, in the whole process. Basically, what does a judge do? deals with a case that comes in front of him or her. We don't go out and arrest people. We don't uh, write the laws that determine what's considered to be criminal and what is not. We don't do that. So, and I'll give you ex an example, because this was a part of uh, the breakout session, part of our discussion. Um, in 1990, I went to visit a friend of mine in Holland, Michigan. Now, we, we both were from the west side of Chicago. He went to Farragut, I went to Marshall. We went to college together. Uh, his job took him to Holland, Michigan, and he lived there for maybe about five years before I had a chance to go visit. Um, at that time, he was working at, uh, I believe the name of the college was Hope College. Uh, working with Hope College, and he was a, uh, a recruiter. And he was telling me about Holland, Michigan. Holland, Michigan is a, a small, rather affluent uh, community on the uh, eastern shores of Lake Michigan, beautiful place. Uh, and we were just talking about uh, my job. At that time, I had been assigned to uh, juvenile court. I think I'd been there maybe a year. And we were talking about how young people are, are treated based on their a criminal conduct. In Chicago, uh, a young kid gets arrested. The police will arrest for a small amount. We were talking about, uh, at that time, I believe it was cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're processed. In Holland, Michigan, there's a station adjustment, and the parents are called. And he said it was almost unheard of for a child in Holland, Michigan, to end up in juvenile court for possession of a small amount of <coughs> cocaine. And I said, it's unheard of <laughs> for a child in Chicago, particularly in, in our community, to not end up uh, in, the, uh, in the police station and the odds of that parents 
uh, of that child's parents being called is relatively slim, or they'll be called eventually because they have to be. Um, and he gave me, we, we went back and forth with that, many different examples about how uh, crimes, the same crime, is treated differently. And, and what's the difference? It's the community. That's part of the difference. Um, Michelle Alexander's book, I think, is instructive mm -hmm. because <clears throat> I believe that, that this, this country has, has, uh, has assisted uh, uh, large corporations in making lots of money mm -hmm. um, on incarcerating basically our people. Um, it's the American way. It's called capitalism. Mm -hmm. Now, I was a part of that system. I was a part of that system. I was a part of the process that I had a case in my courtroom where a young man that was 16 years old, I sent to the penitentiary for life because he killed a police officer. Uh, I recall at the time that I may have said something to the effect of, uh, you know, I don't really, the death penalty is not something that I, that I necessarily ascribe to, but, uh, and you're not eligible for the death penalty because at that time he was not. And, uh, and he, he clearly committed the crime. There was no question about that. Uh, but my feelings at the time was that if the death penalty was available to him, I, I might consider it. But the law required me to sentence him to the penitentiary for life. I have matured a bit since then. I've thought about that, and I'll make a confession. This is the first time I've said it publicly, but I think that was a... I probably should have not sentenced him to the penitentiary. First of all, the idea that we send a child mm -hmm. to the criminal division mm -hmm. to be treated and adjudicated as an adult, in my opinion, is barbaric. Mm -hmm. I think that, that we should... I really wish that I had thought that way back then. I would have done something differently. Um, that's a confession. You know, we, we, we grow in faith, okay? We, this life is a journey, it's not a destination, and you learn as you go along. If there was a road map, road map for life, <clears throat> most of us probably wouldn't follow it anyway. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that, that I think that what we are doing with our children is, is barbaric. Um, and so, when we send a child from the eighth grade to high school not capable of reading, in my opinion, that's barbaric because you are simply sentencing that child essentially to a lifetime of not being able to support him or herself or be a productive member of society. When we send a young man to the penitentiary, now in particular, for whatever reason, and all we do is warehouse that person right. for a particular period of time and let him out. What in the world do we expect that right. person to do after they come out of the penitentiary? I'll go one step further. If we sentence a person to probation for a felony offense, mm -hmm. what you have done is you have sentenced that person to a lifetime more than likely of mm -hmm. not being able to get a job. How does that right. person support him or herself? How do they support a family? In other words, as much as we would like to believe that we are uh, a civilized society, we have to take a really good look at what we're doing. And I've been a part of that process. I'd like to be a part of the solution. One of the things that I'm doing right now is uh, I'm uh, working with a program that's called uh, Adult Redeploy Illinois. Somebody mentioned Redeploy Illinois on the juvenile side. I don't believe that Cook County has at this point no, we have. Juvenile Redeploy Illinois. Yeah. Let me just take an opportunity to, it's not a pitch as much as it is, as it is an advertisement. Uh, Redeploy Illinois is designed to divert people who have committed Felony offenses for adults, that is. Low-level felony offenses from the penitentiary into 
some type of program to address their criminal behavior. Um, first of all, it saves the state money. The figures are vary, but essentially it costs somewhere between $22,000 to $35,000 a year, depending on which study you look at and which numbers you, you look at, to, to uh, keep an individual in the penitentiary for a year. Uh, many times I sentenced someone to the penitentiary for, let's say, a, a, a class two a drug offense, um, knowing that once that person completed their, their time in the penitentiary, nothing's really going to change. They haven't been re rehabilitated. There's no rehabilitation going on in the penitentiary. As a matter of fact, the penitentiary right now is one, of the, is one place where mental health issues are being addressed. The penitentiary is not the place right. to address mental health. Right. In my opinion, that's barbaric. If a person has mental health issues, those issues should be addressed in a place that's designed for that. The penitentiary is not. But I, dig I digressed a little bit. The Adult Redeploy Illinois program <clears throat> started out with a federal grant of about $4 million. The first year, that $4 million saved the state of Illinois <coughs> about $7.5 million because it diverted a certain number of people, I don't know the numbers, from the penitentiary. Last year, that same program saved the state of Illinois almost $18 million. In other words, those people that were diverted from the penitentiary were sent to different programs, and each county has the opportunity to develop their own programs to address what that community believes would be the appropriate response and, and, and address to criminal behavior. A lot of it comes down to education. Mm -hmm. Because the very person that was essentially shuffled through the school system and comes out not able to read also can't fill out a form to, to, right. to get a job. Get a job. Right. And it's amazing the number of, of, of uh, defendants, of convicted felons, who cannot read. Well, how do you expect a, a felon to, who can't read to get a job? Even if they weren't uh, discriminated against because of their criminal background. Mm -hmm. They can't fill out the application. So, I can stop now. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Judge Sumner had alluded to Michelle Alexander's book. For those of you who haven't read it, I recommend it. It's called The New Jim Crow. Uh, Redeploy Illinois is thriving. The money that uh, it has saved the state, Judge Sumner's uh, numbers are correct. It is thriving. It is flourishing. It is downstate Illinois. It is not Cook County. Well, Cook County actually has an adult they're, program, but they just got started. Not, they just got it. It's, it's been going on before. And again, it's even more necessary, I think, for juveniles. And there is a redeploy, uh, Illinois, available for juveniles. So you need to think about it um, when you think about justice or just us. Um, Father Flager, one thing, one thing because it's already, lots of us got up early. I know your schedule. What do we need to take from here and work on every day? Let me say two things. Okay, I'll take two. That's the reason I say that is, is one thing I believe is all of us have to be engaged in our communities in the city. We can study it, we can read about it, we can examine it, but we have to be engaged. What makes Liz so successful is she is engaged in those young people. They're not just her students, she's engaged in their lives. You know, what, what the judge talked about, being engaged with those people's lives, and how do we change it and just put them into the, because the law says send them into the system, how do we help intervene and, and do a interrupting of that, of that child's life and put them back so they can be mainstream again? So I think, all of us have a responsibility to be engaged in the lives of our young people and help them rather than let the system that is designed to just keep flowing as it is in the schools and many will just get dropped out or pushed out or quit because they're frustrated or into the prison system. 
and we just create this vicious circle. So I think we have to be engaged, but I think, think we also have to understand that, that um, our young people are worth it. That kid, that 16 year old worth, those kids in your school are worth, that kid on 79th Street, they're worth it. And, and many of us here got where we were because somebody cared about us. And if we don't care about these kids, we're really, tell we're, although we can sit and talk about the society has abandoned them, we're part of, we're co-conspirators. If we don't stop that and change that. So getting involved and caring and believing in these young people. Principal Dozier, what's the, what's the one takeaway? Or what's the one thing you w say you would is essential to keeping Finger up going and moving in the right direction? I think Michelle Obama said it best uh, when she was in Chicago not too long ago, and she talked about how resources just matter. Mm -hmm. And when we don't provide schools, um, and other programs, institutions with resources, how do we expect things to get better? And so I think it's from my vantage point, resources matter, but I really believe that the people have control of that. Who's in office? Who are elected officials? How are we engaging, I guess back to the engagement, how are we engaging in that political process to make sure that things that actually matter are, are funded? And so I think it just goes back to resources and engagement at the end of the day. Uh, we're going to stay on track, so what I'd like to do now, if people have questions for anybody on the panel, and Judge Summer, you use your, read, you, your time up on read Okay. Read up. okay. Uh, if you could form a line, because this is being taped, so we need you to use the mic. So are there questions for our panelists, comments, things people want to say? Yes, yeah, step up. Just come on up. Please. Yeah, you got to come all the way up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Corey Jordan. I am a pediatrician, actually not too far from here at the Friend Family Health Center. Could everybody hear me? There we go. Yeah. All right. Corey Jordan, pediatrician at the Friend Family Health Center, and my question is actually for Principal Dozier. Um, I just wanted to know, and you may or may not be able to answer this question, if anyone is actually looking into or investigating why kids are getting to high school? Like, are they trying to problem solve that? I think uh, I, can, I can speak um, just from my own experience. I, people know, I mean, it's not a secret. You can't be a teacher within a school and you have a classroom for an entire year and you don't know student, a student can't read or students can't read. Um, I think that people are aware of and I think uh, they have varying solutions in terms of how to address it. Um, but yeah, I think overall people are aware. I mean, I've talked to everyone from our alderman to the mayor to Arnie Duncan, who's the secretary of education to, I mean, you just name it, like Dick Durbin. Like, I've, I've talked about this. I know I'm not the only one voicing it. So I think people know. I think they have varying degrees of what they believe on how, how to solve the issue. Um, but it basically boils down to figuring out supports and safety nets for all kids. And unfortunately, there are areas not only within our city, but within our country where kids just get left behind. And there's the, uh, a saying I heard someone say, where well, you're, you're going to have just, they call them casualties of war. We're going to have casualties of war. It's going to be a certain percentage of kids that just aren't going to do X. And I just fundamentally believe that's just absolutely ridiculous. Like being able to read, write, and be able to be a productive member of society is everyone's God-given right. And so to think that there can just be casualties within this is ridiculous. But I do think people know they just have varying ways of uh, figuring out how they'd like to address it on a, a political um, and economic level. Uh, hi, I'm Rabbi Atsuberi. I'm at um, Urban Youth Trauma Center at UIC. Um, the question is really for all of you, but maybe you two mostly because you do organizational work. How did you get people's buy-in? So like when you came to Finger, um, they already kind of had a way of standard operating procedure, teachers, um, and so engaging organizations when you come to make a shift, um, how did you engage people to uh, make that shift with you? 
I don't think it was, to, I'm, I'm a very honest person, I'm pretty transparent. I don't think there was actually a, a plan in place for that. I think that we came at a time when there was a lot of crisis, like within the school. If you look at my school the first year that I was there, there were over 300 arrests inside of the school building. And students weren't being arrested for small things. They were being arrested for, you know, fights. And so really just, uh, the school was just in a, a major crisis. Father Flager, he, he was there that first year with us as well. And so in, in talking about how to engage like a larger entity and organizations, it became a matter of we needed partners. So how can you help? Like it's bigger than just the school. To think that a school can just figure everything out, like it's like it's a community. It's, a, it's, it's how, how does the community engage? And so really just coming to people with uh, a need for help and to figuring out how they fit in. A lot of people have different programs and things that they want to bring to the school, but like what is the, like what are you actually doing? What are your results? How do we know you're able to really work well with our kids? And just to add with that, and I think it's a difficult struggle because people don't and people want it just not to come to their backyard, not to come to their home, to their family. But I think we're living in a day when we're seeing it is coming to your backyard. It's coming every place, to every family, to every home. This violent situation is. I remember marching with uh, the group Moms Demand uh, Action. Um, and I was marching with them on this, about the violence after the Sandy Hook. And I stopped at this one woman next to me along the way and I just said, you know, I gotta ask her this because this is something that's just raging inside of me. I says, nobody cared about 500 black children and brown children being shot in Chicago. Violence was not an issue until 20 babies in Sandy Hook. And then all of a sudden, when it happens in Newtown, then the whole country talks about outrage, about violence, and it becomes an issue. And in all her innocence and, and simplicity, she turned to me and she said, you know, Father Mike, she said, when I saw those babies in Newtown, I saw my son and my daughter. She said, when I see a kid on the west side of the south side of Chicago and the news has been shot, I feel bad, but I don't connect. And that's unfortunately the reality. You know, every week on the end of George Stephanopoulos this week in America, they list people who have soldiers or military that have died that week. They don't say if they're black, they're brown, they're gay, they're straight, they're male, they're female. They are military, the United States soldiers. And we all feel anguish. But we don't feel the same way about children. When are we going to decide that a child who can't read or who's sitting in jail or who's dead is a United States citizen? When do we have that same kind of care? It doesn't make a difference. They're poor, they're rich, they're educated, uneducated, gay, straight, wherever they come from, kids. And until we change quick that, I just think it's a struggle to make people care. Yes, uh, we had the opportunity to talk a bit. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Davis. I'm a 35-year veteran of Chicago Public Schools and an administrator. Uh, the problem starts before they even reach high school, and I'm directing that to, to Ms. Dozier. Uh, I think the feeder schools, the elementary schools, I don't know what your feeder schools are around Finger, but the problem starts there. Early intervention is so important. We have so many young parents. But I'd like to know what kind of funding. Everyone wants to put the problem and the blame on the schools. But there has to be a connection with the community, the parents. I see so many troubled parents. Uh, the homeless list is outrageous of the students that are coming to school and you are accepting what you get from the elementary schools. I was a transition principal coordinator with all the closings of the schools up and down the State Street corridor. Some of those children have not arrived at any other school. One of the worst things that CPS did was getting rid of the truant officers. We are not tracking what is happening to the students. And when you get them from elementary school and they can't read, then the burden and the criticism is on you. And I think you're doing a wonderful job, but I'd like to know how your funding is. Our kids, especially our boys, if they look the wrong way, if they have three or more absences, they're chronic truants, they kick them out of school and they throw them under the bus to the wolves. So what kind of programs do, what do you think could 
make a bridge between the elementary school and the high school that would help? So there's a couple of things that we just organically do because we feel it is the right thing to do. So any child that doesn't show up within that first couple of days of school, our team, teachers, security, um, uh, main office staff, anybody who works at Finger High School goes out, we break up into teams and actually go figure out where our kids are, making sure they get actually connected from the eighth grade to, even if it's not us, to some school so that we know, like we had last year about 100 kids that didn't show up, they didn't make that transition, finding out where they are and making sure they have a connection. For us, and they don't have true officers anymore, that's correct. So what we've done is we've hired our own, we call them student advocates, and they're the people that actually, there's uh, two of them that we have on staff, and they actually make sure that we maintain a really strong connection um, with the home if we can't get parents necessarily in the building, going out to the parents. Um, what you'll find is oftentimes that you know, people can you know, say this and this about parents, but parents are having their own struggles too. And I mean, it's, it's very real. And so really trying to make sure that we're addressing some of their needs as well. And so making sure we have partnerships and connections to help parents out as well. And so those student advocates really serve as the, the bridge within our particular school community. And then also engaging the teachers. So every, I would say, three weeks or so, a team of teachers will go out. And if, we, if you know, parents can't come to school, like we go out as a <coughs> as team, and we'll go out and we're actually visiting homes and checking on children and seeing what's going on. And it could be a good visit or it might be another type of visit. Um, but just really making sure that we are staying connected to our families and to our children because at the end of the day, if we let them fall through the cracks, then what happens? This is, I always tell my staff, this is the last stop. Right. You know, there's no other chance. Once, you, once, once high school is over, right. I mean, that's it. And so it's not, I, I also say that, you know, even if you don't believe in social justice and, you know, equity for all or what, whatever the case may be, it's an economic issue. So what happens if you don't have a high school diploma at the bare minimum, if you can't read these types of things, then what happens to you? I mean, it affects our overall city and community. So really just trying to make sure we have those webs, again, the anger management, trauma therapy, those things that can keep kids engaged within the school community. Um, thank you so much. So much appreciation and respect for all of your brave leadership, as well as those in the audience. I wanted to share um, an important resource. I'm the executive director of First Defense Legal Aid, which is the only way people in Chicago police custody can actually access their right to counsel. Um, I'm also a parent and a foster parent and a mentor in the Market Park neighborhood, where we have the highest numbers of juvenile arrests, almost all nonviolent. Um, so first defense really needs for people to call right away when you know of an arrest, because currently the Chicago Police Department's practice is to wait until they're done with someone, including juveniles, um, to give them access to that phone call. And so if everybody could put our number into your phones, if you're part of an institution, um, a DCFS agency, a school, a CPS, wonderful to even write it into your policies that when police are engaged, when you know of an arrest, that the staff are to call us right away. Um, the number is 1-800-LAW-REP-4. It's 1-800-529-7374. Um, we are open 24 hours a day. It's always free. And many people don't know that even the public defenders are not able to represent someone in the Chicago Police Department custody. It's, everybody has the right to counsel as soon as they're not free to leave. Um, your client, Xavier, other stories show what an impact it can have on a young person not having any hope that they could even access their rights. And I believe it does come back to the theme of this conference, um, connecting violence to juvenile rights. Um, there was a study that came out of um, the Vera Institute recently where young people in areas where stop and frisk is the norm, they experience that as a trauma, as violence. And these young people are very unlikely to engage police even when they themselves are the victims of violent street crime. And so this is a way where we can all um, have a hand in actually letting people access their rights so the Miranda warnings are not a joke. It's not another way that our young people are alienated, marginalized from constitutional and human rights. Um, and we're actually able to do something very practical to intervene in this cradle to prison, mass incarceration system that we're talking about today. So one more time, let me give you the number. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's one 800 
529-7374. Um, and you have to call as soon as you know someone is arrested, and we'll always have a free lawyer available to go straight to the station and actually let that person hold on to their rights, not waive them for lack of hope or knowledge that they can access counsel. So thank you again so much, and please take that step um, and let people around you know the number, um, because it's really, there's so many barriers to people accessing it, even who know about it, right? So please pass it on, and thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, in that same vein, if there, if there is anyone here who has a service, a resource, or anything else, please give it to one of the students or one of the staff that's walking around here. What we hope to do is not just what we're about to do, but we're going to talk about this, but this is our second year, and I've been talking about it for 20 years. I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing, but I feel like I need to be acting more. Uh, so if you've got some resources, if you've got some suggestions, please leave them uh, with us. We may actually be going back, I don't know, to the 60s or 70s. It might be time to join Father Flager and uh, Principal Dozier. You know, it might be time for us to get our little selves out there in the street. And I love meeting with you here, but I, I think I wanna see you at somebody's school. I wanna see you at somebody's church. I wanna see you at somebody's hospital. And I'm hoping that the people here will hold us at the University of Chicago and any other institution that you come in contact with accountable at a very direct level, not just can you host an event, but you weren't at the school when the kid got put out. And that's why I love First Defense. They, they are boots on the ground, okay? They are boots on the ground. They go to police stations all over the city to help kids immediately and directly. Uh, so we would encourage all of you to get involved. And you know, you're not that old, you can do something. If you don't have boots, put on your gym shoes, okay? Um, can I just you, interrupt one second to say, please, we can start a fight right here at University of Chicago with the Trauma Center? Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you, you want to fight, I won't be looking. I won't be there to testify against you. Uh, <laughs> and for people who may not be familiar, the University of Chicago, you know where we are located, they do not have, they have a child trauma center, right. but they do not have an adult trauma center, and their definition of adult is 18. Uh, and there have been instances of young men and women wounded, uh, and they have been bypassed from the University of Chicago. There's an extraordinary burden on Christ Hospital, which is on the far west side, uh, southwest side of the city, right. to take all of these trauma victims. Um, and there was a concerted effort. There was some internal fighting here. Uh, God love our students. Our students took that fight. Um, they lost. Uh, but if we stopped fighting just because we lost, probably none of us would be here today. <laughs> right. So rest up, heal your bruises, let's come up with a plan of action, and on that note, let's get out there and fight whoever needs to be fought. Okay? Thanks.